the initial muscles which are involved are cranial muscles cranial muscles head and neck muscles right especially these patient onset of disease is most of the time it is with extraocular muscle weakness when extraocular muscles are weak you develop ptosis drooping of upper eyelid you may develop diplopia because when extraocular muscles uh, are weak they cannot move the eyeballs in a coordinated fashion you are understanding for example one side medial rectus is weak if i'm looking there if this medial rectus is weak this eye will keep on looking front and this eyeball will rotate but this will keep looking front and there will be two image made and i will perceive as if there is diplopia double image of the visual field objects in the visual field so this patient classically come with ptosis of eyeballs not ptosis of eye but ptosis of upper eyelid so this patient classically present with weakness of extraocular muscle which clinically cranial muscles is classical presentation right in which patient may develop with ptosis then diplopia then this patient may also develop yes difficulty in you come down chewing chewing you cannot chew is that right difficulty in chewing and then difficulty in swallowing swallowing is reduced chewing is reduced and then even <coughs> ability to articulate that is articulation speech become disturbed speech of these patient become slurred so what really happens this patient all of the patient do not develop all things but generally this patient generally they start as cranial symptoms and they develop ptosis and diplopia and then they develop uh, difficulty in chewing and swallowing right it means muscles of mastication are weak and muscles of swallowing, swallowing. which muscles pharyngeal esophagus because remember uh, upper part of esophagus and uh, lower part of pharynx they are having skeletal muscle voluntary muscles and middle and lower part of the esophagus are smooth muscle so swallowing become difficult and many of these patient when if they are not diagnosed well due to reduced intake of food they have weight loss as well right and then difficulty in speech because muscles which uh, which produce articulation you know there are two process uh, one process is phonation phonation is production of the sound from the larynx laryngeal muscles do phonation and then sound which is produced it is converted by movement of the yes tongue and lips and soft palate hard palate doesn't move these days it, uh, rather it doesn't move usually until okay so uh, these palatal muscles and uh, tongue muscles and lips muscles they articulate the sound into words so difficulty in articulation that is called dysarthria and rarely in this patient even vocal cords go into trouble and they are unable to produce the sound properly that is called dysphonia so again start from here what are the problems extraocular muscle problem ptosis and diplopia, diplopia. then bulbar muscle problem bulbar mean those muscles where cranial nerves are coming from the bulb medulla 9th 10th 11th 12th these nerves control your articulation they also control your phonation they also control swallowing so these patient may also develop difficulty in chewing difficulty in swallowing dysphagia and difficulty in articulation dysarthria or even difficulty in produce production of the sound that is dysphonia and it may be even some sound is produced but because soft palate does not move well so there is nasal twang in the sound nasal twang mean nasal characteristics are produced in the sound patient will not say how are you he will say how are you right so nasal twang and even sometimes muscles of facial expression are weak and patient look sad of course anyone who is very weak is already sad and then muscles of facial expression are also not working well and if you force this person to smile he will have a happy smile or sad smile yes. sad smile mm. so this this smile is called uh, what is it called myasthenic snarl myasthenic thenic snarl snarl anyway so these are the cranial features so most of the, these patient develop features from the this area now in majority of the patient then weakness spread over the body 
It starts from the top and goes down. down. Don't tell goes to the bottom. It goes down. And uh, yes, but few lucky patients, few lucky patients, disease remain limited to extraocular muscles, right? And if it goes down, then it may involve the neck. It may involve uh, limp girdles, shoulders, and hips. And then it may develop, of course, even it can, in some unfortunate patients, it severely involves the respiratory muscles. So much so that a small percentage of patients sometimes need to put on the mechanical. mechanical ventilation. When this disease attacks so much, we say there is myasthenic crisis. What is there? Myasthenic, myasthenic crisis. What is myasthenic crisis when myasthenia gravis patients? Disease becomes so severe that even muscles of respiratory system are unable to maintain adequate ventilation. Is that right? So again, disease starts from cranial region and then it goes down. Why I'm stressing so much? Because tomorrow when we'll record the lecture on Lambert-Eaton, that disease starts from bottom and goes up. Right? In Lambert-Eaton, it starts from the limb muscle, especially from the hip girdle. Right? So if a patient has severe weakness of muscles and it is starting from cranial going down, think of Yes. But if another patient has severe weakness and it is from the what is this uh, hip region and shoulder girdle and limbs and later on it may become eye signs later on right then think of Lambert Eaton is that right so we say patient with Lambert Eaton Lambert Eaton uh, myasthenic syndrome they develop gait abnormalities gait mean catwalk okay gait abnormalities before the eye signs right and patient is myasthenia gravis typically develop eye problems before the gait problems am i clear now these are the clinical features that how do these patients present but again its clinical features and investigations and its management will be done in detail in detail in lectures of clinical medicine here i'm just touching or brushing the points in pathology right now we come to yes another thing that the, those patients who have anti musk antibodies they are having more focal muscle weakness patient who have my, myasthenia gravis due to anti musk antibodies there actually it is what focal these patients may have only cranial muscle or only neck muscle the shoulder muscles but myasthenia gravis has have a tendency that many patients develop widespread generalized weakness but in case yes those myasthenic patient senior gravis patient which are having anticholinergic antibodies. antibodies they tend to develop generalized but uh, those patients who have anti must antibodies they tend to develop more focal weakness right now we come to another concept and that is <coughs> that after the clinical features how do you diagnose these patients right how do you diagnose these patients so diagnosis of these patients, of course, diagnosis of these patients depends on four factors. Number one, of course, you should have history of patient, especially weakness, which is gradual onset, insidious, fluctuating, worsens on sustained effort, repetitive effort, and worsens over the day, overall fluctuating. Think of myasthenia gravis. Secondly, physical examination. Physical examination, when you study the neuromuscular system of this patient, usually weakness is more in onset is weakness is more in cranial regions, but later on it may involve. Secondly, in this patient, sensations are normal. Sensations, the sensory system is normal. Deep tendon reflexes are normal, right? History, physical examination, then investigations. In investigations of these patients, especially thing which help in investigation is presence of R2 antibodies. Either anticholinergic receptor R2 antibodies, the antibodies against the cholinergic nicotinic receptors, or in some patients, anti musk antibodies. Right? They help in the investigation. Number one, antibodies, R2 antibodies. Number two, investigation. There is a very special investigation that when, now listen carefully. When a, a nerve is motor nerve is stimulated for a specific muscle, electrically, when the, you do repetitive stimulation, what do you do? Yeah. Repetitive stimulation of what? Yeah. Motor nerve to a specific muscle, the muscle response will gradually become decreased. decreased. 
so we say in patient with myasthenia gravis right there is decremental muscle response on repetitive stimulation of specific nerve motor nerve this is very important point you know why it helps you to differentiate myasthenia gravis from lambertitan in lambertitan patient if you do stimulation repetitive stimulation to a specific motor nerve the motor response transiently become more right but in the, again if here is a patient okay this is a patient with myasthenia gravis and this is a patient with lambertitan in both cases you stimulate the motor nerve and see uh, repeatedly repetitively and look at the motor response here the muscle motor response will progressively become down and here motor muscle response will at least transiently increase so we say the word which is used is technical word which is used it that on repetitive stimulation of mo uh, motor nerves to specific muscle is followed by decremental response and here same activity lead to incremental response right then the other investigations these were electrophysiological studies then other investigation important is in these patient we also do ct scan or mri of to look for thymoma or thymic hyperplasia is there any increase in the thymus mass or not right now and then some tests are done one test is done tensilon test now it is done less often but anyway tensilon is a protein this is a drug which is having active agent adrophonium adro phonium adrophonium now this is very short acting anticholinesterase drug in this case what happens let's suppose this is your neuron and this is your muscle with myasthenia gravis situation and here is what what is this anti cholinesterase as i told you that acetylcholine is released from here and then it bind and stimulate these receptors but in patient with myasthenia gravis number of receptors are decreased is that right now if you give a drug a drug which can bind on now normally what happen when acetylcholine come act over here and then acetylcholine is destroyed by acetylcholinesterase what is this acetyl cholinesterase enzyme now if you give a drug which is anti cholinesterase what is that anti cholinesterase or acetyl cholinesterase inhibitor for example this is the drug right and if this drug bind here will it allow this anti cholinesterase to work no then half life of acetyl choline in this area will increase, increase. even the receptors are less but concentration of acetyl choline become very high and with less available receptors over stimulation of less available receptor still may produce sufficient end plate potential and patient is able to contract his muscles and weakness is improved you are getting it this is how anti cholinesterase drugs work in patient with myasthenia gravis now adrophonium is it comes with the name of tensilon it is very short acting anti cholinesterase drug for few minutes so what happens that in these patient we look at a muscle of weakness for example patient uh, has stosis right and if you give him a uh, tensilon or this injection but it should be given carefully and that is why now it is used less because it has some side effects so you will find that very there is rapid but transient improvement and patient is able to lift his eyelid or uh, whatever movement you are asking the patient to do for example if he is very weak and he cannot do counting up to he goes counting only up to 20 and become tired maybe now he can do counting up to 120 and so depending upon your parameter but there is significant transient improvement what improvement in muscle power and muscle function after the short acting and this reminds me another thing another interesting test is uh that sometimes if patient has stosis with this disease we apply the ice to his what upper eyelid for 2 minutes and after that extraocular muscle especially uh, levator palpebris superioris is able to function better and upper eyelid is lifted up what is the mechanism ice freezes the 
and acetylcholine esterase very good and when acetylcholine esterase is frozen it does not work and whatever uh, as a few receptors are there they are overstimulated and able person is able to lift his eyelids right anyway these things will be discussed in detail in medicine lectures so these were some investigation and now the modern treatment modalities i will discuss treatment methods very briefly because we'll discuss detail in medicine number 1 the four or five basic method number 1 the first line of management is that is anticholinesterase drug anti cholinesterase drugs right these drugs once with adrophonium you confirm that disease is there then you give relatively longer acting drugs for example there we use either pyridostigmine pyridostigmine or we use neostigmines neostigmine or any combination of these and pyridostigmine or neostigmine is used as anticholinesterase drugs which will inhibit in these patients anticholinesterase and acetylcholine half life at neuromuscular junction will be increased and patient but the remember problem only with these drugs is over the years they lose their efficacy because over many many years if disease become pro progressive receptors become so low that even more acetylcholine does not help much right then another way to treat this patient is reduce the production of r20 bodies for that purpose we can give drugs which are immuno suppressive right and immuno suppressive drugs like corticosteroids and with them we can give azathioprine or cyclosporine or there are many other immuno suppressive drugs right so either we give anticholinesterases or with that if anticholinesterases are not helping much you can give immuno suppressive drugs right so that production of r20 bodies is reduced and if patient is really very weak you can remove the r20 bodies out of the person circulation and for that purpose we do plasma pheresis that is a mechanism by which we remove the r20 bodies from the patients yes patients plasma. plasma and in the end if you are really sick of this whole situation and unable to manage think of removing the thymus especially if there is thymoma because thymoma may become malignant and you cannot wait right but they say that if you do thymectomy if you do thymectomy thymectomy is very beneficial in patient with thymoma and also somewhat beneficial in patient with thymic hyperplasia the long term studies are showing that with thymectomy 25% patient have full remission of the disease Thymo thymectomy is done only in those patients who are anti cholinergic receptor antibody positive anti musk antibodies we don't consider thymoma because anti cholinergic receptor r20 bodies production has some relationship with thymic abnormalities right so 25% patient develop what full full recovery about 50% patient develop significant benefit and 25% patient may not develop any benefit from thymectomy but still uh, in chosen cases especially patients who are Uh, younger than 50 to, uh, 50 years or patients who are not responding well to anticholinesterases uh, we prefer to do thymectomy especially if there is thymoma right and of course in some cases to reduce the r20 body load as i told you either you can do immunofluorescence uh, immu what is this sorry plasma for this or you can also give intravenous immuno intravenous amino globulins which also transiently improve the patient again i'm repeating this will be discussed all investigations clinical features and management will be discussed in detail in clinical lectures and but still i will not forget to tell you please if a person is diagnosed with myasthenia gravis don't treat them there are certain drugs to be avoided those drugs which have a tendency to produce neuromuscular impairment right especially amino glycosides like gentamicin quinines tetracyclines beta blockers procainamide and some others right do you have any question uh, so in the patients of myasthenia gravis which have no uh, abnormality in their thymus how come the antibodies are produced again there yeah this is a very good question that he is saying that those patients uh, who do not have 
apparent abnormality in the thymus, right? How that disease is produced? Okay, let me answer it. First of all, when we say thymic abnormalities, thymoma and hyperplasia, it means these are the apparent abnormalities. There may be functional abnormality in the thymus without making any thymoma or hyperplasia. It's quite possible. Secondly, autoantibodies, not all of them are due to thymic dysfunction. Immune system is scattered all over the body. Maybe defected some other immune head, head, head office. Is that right? Spleen, liver, lymph nodes. Do you understand? Any question more? Sir, yes. Why does the disease start from the cranial muscles and then spread? Yeah, this is very interesting. She is saying why the disease start from the uh, cranial muscles and go down? The answer to this is that uh, these muscles are very heavy in innervation, right? As compared to the muscle mass per unit of innervation, here is less. For example, here motor units are very large. <coughs> One motor neuro exon come and control many many fibers but here one neuron may be controlling one or two fibers only so they are more sensitive am I clear because you understand it or not or more elaboration is required right so that is why some diseases more damage cranial muscles or we say muscle with very refined movements right and some muscle some diseases attack big muscles like girdle muscles is that right but if disease becomes severe then of course it can attack multiple areas right any more question so why there is fluctuating muscle weakness yeah the, he is saying that why there is fluctuating muscle weakness the reason being immune system keep on fluctuating it's very volatile system look at females oh, even with there is hormones immune system fluctuate even you are a boy with fever your immune system performance will fluctuate with infection it will fluctuate if you are fatigued you have played a lot then it is, it will, you are under mental stress, your immune system fluctuates. So immune system is very sensitive. Because immune system fluctuates, right, then immune system related diseases are also not very stable. Clear? Any more question? Okay, class dismissed. Stay blessed.